It was an exciting day with some unexpected adventure. My sister Peggy and I had been invited to help Dad haul a bull from the Wagonshine Ranch near Encino, Texas, back home to our rising Sterling Ranch in Edinburgh, Texas. Dad had needed to bring a bull to crossbreed a bunch of mostly Hereford cows that he and Mr. Rising had purchased. They were striving for the hybrid vigor that would result from crossing these two breeds. Well, I was about 13, and Peggy was three years older. The ranch truck, an old flatbed military truck, was a rough riding machine that bounced over the potholes in the Caliche paved Monte Cristo Road, and we kicked up a long cloud of white Caliche dust as we lumbered to the east. Upon reaching Highway 281, we proceeded north, passing by the little settlements of Lynn, Redgate, San Manuel, Rachel, and continued north through the historic King Ranch. Highway 281 had been an unpaved sand trail back in the 1920s when the Hecock family drove over it, but now it was a modern, two-lane, paved superhighway, at least by the standards of that time, which was about 1947. Anyway, it led us to our western turnoff onto the Wagonshine Ranch between Encino and Valfurious, a short distance past the location of the present Border Patrol checkpoint. The name Valfurious is thought to be the Spanish name for a native desert flower known as Heart's Delight, but I digress. It was not difficult to recognize the approach into the village of Encino because that's where the belt of live oak Sandy Lands began. Encino is an appropriate name for this unofficial town because the Spanish word means oak. Having seldom traveled this far north of Edinburgh, I marveled at the change of scenery from the mesquite dominated scrub brush to these beautiful oaks. Okay, they were rather scrubby, stunted live oaks, but they presented a clear ecosystem difference from the mesquite, weasatch, cactus, catclaw, wild olive parts of this wild horse prairie scrub brush, as it was called back when. We turned into the gate of the Wagonshine Ranch, and I was amazed at what an idyllic place it was to my young, inexperienced eyes. The countryside was dotted with live oak clumps called mots, growing on undulating, low sand dunes and covered with grass. The oaks provided an abundance of acorns which fed wild turkeys, deer, and javelina, so the animals were relatively abundant. We also saw doves, quail, and cattle. They all ran or flew as we approached. Signs of javelina-eaten cactus pads could all be, also be seen among the pat rat nests built in clumps of cactus. There were no humans in sight, not even wild ones. But all native animals were wonderfully wild. The old truck struggled through the deep sand on this unpaved ranch road that ultimately led us to the corral where Mr. Wagonshine was waiting for us. He seemed like a very nice man, but not overly talkative. His sturdy corral held this big, wild-eyed Brahma bull that we were supposed to load in what was now seemed like a small and almost fragile uh, modified World War II military cattle truck. The sideboards were tall and sturdy, but capable of holding this bull. Of course, the size of this bull has likely grown somewhat in my memory, much like the size of that big bass that got away in many fish stories, but he was big. Somehow we managed to force him to climb the loading ramp into the truck. The truck gate was closed quickly behind him. Of course, he was not very happy about our intrusion into his daily routine. Dad paid Mr. Wagon shine for the bull. We said our goodbyes and drove back that sand-soft trail. I glanced back at Mr. Wagonshine, and I thought I caught a hint of a smile. 
Maybe he was happy to be done with that cantankerous bull. Yes, that bull was now Dad's, for better or worse. With this added weight of the bull, the trunk's truck sank a little deeper into the sand, but Dad expertly managed to keep us from sticking. He maintained the truck in the highest gear possible without killing the engine. The goal was to keep the tires from spinning in the soft sand, because that would cause the tires to sink, and we certainly did not wish to be stuck in the burning hot salt sand. So we chugged, bounced, and slowly made our way back through the oaks and pastures. Maybe about halfway to the Highway 281, we heard some loud banging and looked back through the rear window. Our bull had hooked his right horn into the sideboards and had lifted them out of the brackets that usually held them semi-secure in the truck bed. He was dangerously close to jumping off the truck and escaping. If he managed to jump off our truck, it might take days to round him up on this large ranch and to reload him. Undoubtedly, he had some notion of escaping his hot, bouncing prison to find some shade, sweet grass, and some attentive cows. But he was on the horns of a dilemma, so to speak. Although he had successfully lifted the sideboards on the right side, he could not jump off the truck because the sideboard posts were still firmly in his place and uh, his horns were still stuck in the sideboards. Anyway, Dad stopped the truck began to assess the situation. The poor bull stood in the bed of the truck with his tall sideboard dangling from his right horn and looking both mad and bewildered. I think that Dad likely felt about the same way. But Peggy and I were mostly just worried and excited. Dad ultimately gave us our marching orders, which, according to Sister Peggy, was something like, when I yell, I want you two to crawl out the front window of the truck and slide over the hood onto the ground. Then crawl under the truck, out of the reach of the bull, and pull the ropes I hand you under the truck so I can tie them on the other side. Now remember, this was a used World War II Army truck, so the front window folded out, which allowed Peggy and I to escape. Somehow, with a little coaching from Dad, the bull decided to change tactics, so it lowered its head, untangled its horn from the sideboard slats, the sideboard posts fell back in their metal brackets, the prison break was thwarted. But to prevent the bull from lifting the sideboards again, Dad used this one long lariat. He didn't wish to cut a good lariat in pieces, so we used one end on each side of the truck. Dad tied one side, then handed the rope to us under the truck so we could crawl the loose end to the other side where we could tie it down too. Unfortunately, the ground under the truck was covered with goat head type sand burrs, which were very unkind to our knees and hands as we crawled about. But the threat of that big bull was so scary that a little blood and injury from those nasty goat heads seemed real relatively trivial in comparison to what might happen if that bull caught us. After the sideboards were secure, we climbed back in the truck seat, kept a wary eye on the bull, and resumed our journey. Yes, the bull thrashed around some more as we continued to drive, and to our relief, he never again succeeded in lifting the sideboards. Apparently, Dad's common sense solution had worked. The trip back home was then relatively uneventful. Our unhappy, bewildered bull seemed greatly relieved to leave his mobile prison. He bolted down the ramp and was soon uh, with his admiring harem of cows. But that's not the end of this story. Several years later, Dad decided to replace Wagenshine's bull with a newer, more docile breed. His plan was to retire that old bull, that old curmudgeon of a bull, to the Yancey Butcher Shop out on Highway 107 west of Edinburgh, where he could be converted into dog food hamburger or something. Knowing that this bull was fairly hard-headed, ill-tempered, 
and he had grown even larger during his residence in Edinburgh, we suspected he might have some trouble encouraging him to climb the ramp up into the truck. Our head cowboy, Charlie Reyes, led our other Mexican cowboys out into the pasture to herd the bull into the corral where we could have a chance to force him into the truck. But as they approached the gate, the bull, maybe sensing his impending loss of freedom, would have none of it. As they approached the corral gate, the bull broke past the horses and headed back to the pasture. Apparently, the horses did not intimidate him enough. Over and over, the process was repeated until finally our talented cowboys somehow succeeded in closing the corral gate behind him. Now, our bull, in a fit of defiance, ran across the corral and at near full speed hit the shut gate on the other side, headlong, smashing it to smithereens. Now, this was no trivial gate and no trivial bull. The entire corral was built of 2 by 12 planks covered with tar. The planks had been salvaged from a large wooden barge that had once plied the intercoastal canals of Texas. The gate that our bull smashed with such energetic grace was built out of the same material, so now it was again time for our hard-working but tiring cowboys to herd him back into the undamaged section of the corral. Here the wagon shine bull settled down and stood, panting in silent resignation. He glared at all his human participants in this drama, as if daring them to come down from their perch on the top rail of the fence to challenge him for a fair fight. Our cowboys tried to coax and force him into the truck, but the bull resisted. We had tried our hand in forcing him into the chute that led to the ramp and up into the truck. We managed to get him into the chute, but he would go no further. We hollered, we hit him with sticks, pulled him forward with his tail, threatened him with eternal damnation to no avail. No matter how hard we tried, we could not make that bull enter the truck. So dad finally just gave up. And he called Mr. Yancey, the butcher, to drive out with his rifle and shoot the bull and carve him into dog food, hamburger, or whatever. Recently, while remembering this story, Peggy commented that girls were not allowed to attend any kind of potentially traumatic corral operation such as castrations, dehorning, or shooting bulls, so neither Peggy or any of my sisters were witnesses. I found it very difficult operation to watch, but I did. I was not certain that I wanted to watch this assassination, but did watch the first bullet of the 3030 caliber rifle hit the bull in the forehead. All I could see was a small puff of dust where the bullet had hit. The bull just stood there and watched with no apparent harmful effect. I decided not to watch any more shots. So I escaped to another part of the corral and covered my eyes. Several more shots rang out and the bull finally died. I had to admit an admiration for Wagenshine's bull. He was one tough SOB and I was sorry to see him shot. But I understood Dad's reasons and I was relieved that we would not need to face him again. Maybe that obstinate bull also convinced Dad not to use semi-wild, big, ornery Brahma bulls to sire its herds. Anyway, he soon switched to tamer, dumber, pole Santa Gertrudis bulls that he could lead around with a feed bucket. But no matter how tame they were, most of these dumb bulls, or one of these dumb bulls, almost killed me. Had it happened, there would be no Jimmy, Brian, Ellen, or their handsome kids around to hear this story. Anyway, Dad and I were herding this one handsome red bull along the canal bank, and Dad yelled, head him off. So I moved in front of that big good-natured bull while waving my arms, jumping up and down, and shouting. The bull calmly ignored me, kept walking, pushed me to the ground with his nose, 
and walked right over me. I knew that if I acted in some cowardly way by sidestepping that bull, Dad would have yelled at me to stand my ground. Dad must have thought that the 2,000-pound bull had stepped on me, though, and likely squashed my skinny body. After the bull had passed, Dad picked me up out of the dust and ran toward the house where the pickup was available. Apparently, his plan was to rush me to the hospital so they could fix my mangled body I marvel that Dad didn't seem at all concerned that the bull was now escaping. Well, that very nice bull had something, had somehow avoided stepping on me, and I, I was unharmed. But it took a while to convince Dad that I was okay. I seldom saw him so excited, and it made me realize that he really cared for me. A sentiment seldom, if a sentiment seldom, if ever expressed verbally. It was almost worth nearly dying just to experience the attention. Anyway, here I am now, almost 67 years later, having survived those two bulls and several ornery brindle cows, bucking horses, rattlesnakes, skippy risings, gasoline lamp, but that's another story, and a host of other near accidents. Now I'm able to enjoy looking back on those boyhood experiences that didn't kill me, Peggy, or any of our siblings. And it seems rather amazing that all nine of us kids survived to adulthood. In my case, these experiences may have toughened me up for the wild ride I've had through this life. It's been a great ride, and I am undoubtedly one of the luckiest guys in the world, if not Texas.